Was it the worst week in franchise history? I mean, it could have been worse. How, you you say? They could have announced a Vlasic extension. And could there be more sevens this week? The only way that this week could have been worse is if they had traded Hurdle. Oh, wait. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Pucknologist. You're only completely live, unfiltered, unedited, uncensored, commercial-free Sharks podcast. Wrapping up one hell of a week in Sharks hockey, part of Teal Town, USA. As always, if this is your first time checking out our cast, remember to like and or subscribe on the platform of your choice. Leave your takes in the comments section if you're not with us in the live chat. And remember, every episode, kids, we're giving away prizes. Might have even picked up a couple new ones last night. Oh, boy. We're all all those forms of social media, too, in case you care. I don't, but it's all right. All right, uh, it was an impressively bad week for the Sharks. Uh, two back-to-back losses. They gave up seven goals <laughs> in each one in front of their smallest crowds of the season. Unfortunately, not small enough for my bet with Jerk. Uh, but I, I have hope. Couture uh, rules the he's out for the season. wonder if that's going to end up being more than just a season. And they finish it off by trading away the face of the franchise and then uh whew, the amount of stupid <laughs> permeating throughout shark social media about all this the responses from some people i'm just like have you been paying any attention at all i just i don't know <sighs> well see paying attention would require uh, taking your head out of the sand, which seems like some of the Facebook posters, that's where their head is. <laughs> well, it's just this whole idea of like, we want to rebuild, but we want to keep all of our players. It's like, we'll right. pick, you know, pick one, man. <laughs> we, want, we want to keep all the guys that can, that trading away can help us rebuild. Yeah. Uh, uh, just knock your head against the wall some days, man. I just no. I can't wait to get I, off social media. I will say this: the trading of Hurdle, like I don't even care that it's to Vegas. Like him going to Vegas is really just kind of like the that, extra. Twi- it's the extra twist of the knife for knife for me. Aside from that, yeah. I don't really care all that much. But the thing is, it's sad. You know, Hurdle. You are you've been a big Hurdle guy like since he made his NHL debut. I've been a big Hurdle guy really the last five years. Um. So it's legitimately sad, but it can be sad and also the objectively smart and correct thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I feel as with most things, people have a hard time compartmentalizing. Oh, in a big way. All right, let's uh, start off at the beginning of the week. Sharks versus Dallas. (laughs) God, dude, D- could Declare have, like, declared that he wanted out more over this week? <laughs> he picked the best time to get hot. <laughs> <laughs> dude, it was so awesome. Uh, and you got tacos. I did. So what? I only need it two more times, right? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, good so, luck with that now that Hurdle's gone. <laughs> I don't know, dude. I- <laughs> Dude, did you watch uh, yesterday's game? I mean, I yes, know. the Sharks only scored two goals, but they could have easily had three or four the way they were playing. Plus, Philadelphia, brutal. Pittsburgh, brutal. Columbus, brutal. Chicago, brutal. Granted, these are all road games, but the ability to score four goals is there. Hopefully, they can take something from this road trip and bring it back home. Dude, it's the streak. It's 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 going to be that streak in, in April where they play three or four. St. Louis, Arizona, and Calgary. 
Those are the ones Dude. that I'm that I'm eyeballing. I'm like, fuck, he might pull it out there. Chicago on the 23rd, Dallas on the 26th. Well, see, I think uh, Chicago. Now that they're eliminated, I feel like they might just go ham. Here's the, you know what's you know what's going to be choice. In in true uh, in true fashion, uh, the final four goal home game of the season. It's going to be an empty net goal that goes in with a couple seconds left on April 13th against the Wild. <laughs> with the goaltender pulled in overtime. <laughs> yeah, like you're going to see, like, dude, like the Sharks are going to be up three to two. Oh, my God. And Minnesota's going to have their goalie pulled. And you're going to see me, like, every time that puck gets passed down the ice, you're going to see me, like, you know, standing behind the corner with with my curling broom, like just in case I got to come out there and like kind of <laughs> shimmy it into the net. <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> oh, Bob Blazy, dude, you spelled most incorrectly. Just letting you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, the uh, this is the game that right they had like a three goal lead and pissed it away with seven minutes left. <laughs> You're talking about against Dallas, yeah. Yeah, I mean. Dude, but I mean, Duclair scoring on the power play, it was like, okay, Duclair scores, and they get a power play goal, and I'm like, oh, man. And then what it was, <laughs> when it was 6-3, dude, I literally looked, looked over, told my wife, and I'm like, they're going to figure out a way to blow it. Watch this. <laughs> but Duclair with a four-point night, and I was like, yep, he wants out of here so badly, and I go back to that tweet that I had forgotten about where I said, damn, Duclair playing like he wants to get San Jose at least a third back, and then look what happened. <laughs> it was exactly that. <laughs> Worked out really well. <laughs> so the Sharks would blow a lead for the fifth straight game. Uh, again, just shit special teams. They got outshot 41-20. to Oy, oy, oy. And uh, I guess that's the uh, hell of a way to send off Kakinen, I suppose. And getting completely shelled. <laughs> yeah, like, dude. And then Eklund leading the team with a dash four and 26% in a dot. Oh, man. And uh, and on top of it, Chicago lost earlier, so they gave the Sharks back the cellar. And then the Sharks almost pull it out, you know, and then said, no, 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 fuck it. We like 32nd place. Let's piss this away. <laughs> Pavelski taking his first ever penalty against San Jose. And uh, this is the last time San Jose had scored this many goals since December 7th. If you know, you know. Uh, but the quotes, the post-game stuff on this. Dude. Zetterlins. I was on the bench when they scored two goals, their fourth and fifth. We uh, have to learn how to play with the lead. I was focused on myself, not the bench. We have to play with the lead. We have to learn how to win. We should win this game. Kakinen calls it one of his toughest losses. Duclair called it unacceptable. Toughest loss of the season. And this is a team that gave up 10 goals in back-to-back -back games <laughs> and, and had their coach call them out following a 7-1 to loss in Seattle. And But Kakinen, let's be honest, had the best post-game comment of the season where, uh, where he literally said, we had the lead, then we lost the lead. Then the game went to overtime, and then we lost. I mean, that is how I recall it going. <laughs> yeah, can't sum it up better than that. And uh, the Sharks lost a home game when scoring six or more goals for the fifth time in franchise history. But let's hear from the coach following that little, <laughs> little, another debacle. Uh, frustrated, really. I mean, just. Uh... You're up 6-3, you're playing good hockey, staying above it, not giving it much. And uh, you turn over in the neutral zone and floodgates open. You could just feel it, you know, the way that goal happened. It looked like nothing was going to happen. We, I really liked what we did after we got up 6-3. We were just staying above them and playing a good, smart third period. And then that one mistake ends up in the back of our net and you could just feel the uh-oh feeling on the bench and you know the face-off goal the, the tire was really a kick in the ass because we just we had coverage and just puck watched so but you know that's uh it's frustrating i think the thing that really stood out for me is the part where he's like it was an uh-oh moment 
<laughs> <laughs> well, so that like happens every game, doesn't it? I was gonna say, like, it's, how how soon before like how soon before uh you know we get to these post game pressers and it's it's literally just like that clip that you just played like <laughs> on a monitor in front of the in in front of like a bunch of microphones and it's like oh yeah that's the you know that's the quotes from three games ago but it's still relevant dude you are so so accurately correct and uh the the thing that really gets me on this of course is the attendance dude 1070 all I needed it was to be <laughs> 71 less. <laughs> Bullshit. Pashelka, they're, pulling it, they're pulling it out for me, dude. Well, dude, Pashelka tweeted it out that it was like close to, it was more like 6,800. And what's funny is that I have a friend who works at the tank. Okay. And because of what they do, they get, because they're expected to, you know, that this is every you know, type of venue like this. Uh, it's like, even when they hold concerts, it's, they look at how much, uh, how many people come into the gate and they expect to make X amount per head. Mm -hmm. It's called per cap. Yeah. So, so of course the, you know, people like uh, concession people, bartenders, uh, you know, food, all of those guys, they see what the real numbers are. And yeah, I was told that the real number for Thursday was like 72 or something. And I'm like, oh. doesn't, but doesn't surprise me. Yeah. But you know, we distributed an extra like 3,800. So it's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> All right. Um, Islanders game. Corona gets a start and another goalie who fucking gets shelled. And, of course, this was the game where Duclair sat because trade-related reasons. Barabanov sat, trade-related reasons. Kakinen, essentially, trade-related reasons. And uh, Ahochuk, I guess we should have just read into that when he was on the scratch list. Oh, he's getting fucking moved. <sighs> I, I, I don't know. I kind of... <laughs> I, I feel like anybody who quote unquote called that one is just lying or <laughs> or they're the one who like put the trade through. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. But what a I mean, this is another one where it's just the wheels come off. Like they, they tried to claw back and That's then putting it nicely. <laughs> oh dude. And New York rips off like four in a row. It was like three goals scored in less than a minute. It was ridiculous. So it's <sighs> Oh my god. And then what's funny is to see some, you know, as I mentioned towards the beginning of the show is the some of the the fans on social media, the, you know, that they were whining about the Sharks getting creamed for like their second straight game and it's like you're missing your top two centers, declares out. You have your third string goalie in net, Bordelo's first NHL game in forever. Like what did you expect against right. an Isles team that's on a four game win streak fighting for a wild card spot? Like well, I don't know. Well, I don't know if you saw. Um, I don't know if you saw uh, the quote that I tweeted out right after Hurdle was traded. Um, but I feel like it's very apt for this whole situation. You know, life is under no obligation to give us what we expect. <laughs> you so right. <laughs> uh, but you know, since the All Star Game, the Sharks are one eight and two. And you're just like, oh, man, this is just. Ugh. It's right where we want to be. I mean, yeah. And then Ian saying Corona, he would argue fourth string goalie. Okay, sure. <laughs> I'm fine with that. That's fair. Oh, dude. Uh, okay, hold on. Oh, there man. it is. I have not had a sneeze. And uh, you know what? Oh, I read those attendance numbers and it's, I got I had to sneeze because I'm allergic to bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yesterday's game ottawa comes to town and of course you're like well if the sharks are going to beat anybody <laughs> it's probably going to be these guys and you got crona with the start cooley newly acquired cooley los gatos native cooley backing it up in the goalie spot uh hurdles traded uh, and <laughs> and then here's the thing man 
LeBanc can't even crack this fucking lineup. Even with, uh, <coughs> even with two wingers out for trade related reasons, and it's still like, oh. nope, not happening. Sorry. Good lord. Like, I mean, I'm looking now. Yeah, he did get in, but it's not even like he had a chance to play up in the lineup. Yeah, no. It was... It's like okay, the, these two holes opened up, but you're not filling it, so <laughs> don't even think about it. Put your put your bottom six practice jersey back on. What are you doing? Yeah, no doubt. So rare night when all the goals were scored on the power play. The Sharks get more power plays than their opponent, and uh, of course, the singular goal for Ottawa comes from almost Shark Tim Stutzla. His first uh, first goal in eight games too, which. Don't think I didn't keep an eye out. For Did that you have some scratch was, on that? You know what? You know what really uh, bugged me. So, and if, I'll freely admit because I'm an adult. Uh, yesterday was a bad day. I got beat up really bad. Well, not really bad, but beat up bad. And uh, I'm got listen- shoved in I'm a wa- locker. Did you? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm watch. I'm listening to the game. I'm watching the Hockey Night Canada feed, and uh, they say, "Oh, you know." Uh, Tim Tim Stutzla, you know, looking to looking to break his slump right now. He's gone eight games without a goal. And as soon as I heard that, I'm like, motherfucker is gonna score tonight. <laughs> and he did. And I was like, damn it. Like I live I live for those Schneid breaking bets, you know, and I and I missed it last night, but got it got it today with Connor Bedard, so we're all right. Well, uh we do got a super chat in here from Falcon Strike Twenty One. Thank you. Uh what did you think of Borlo? Well, I mean, dudes scored three of the last four goals for the Sharks, so I mean, <laughs> I, I f- don't know that yeah. he's getting sent down anytime soon. I I would be shocked if he was sent down at this point, and I know it's kind of weird to say because he's only played two games, um, but just well, the- it's not like LeBanc <laughs> is going to force the issue. Right, but like, you know, he's, it, it seems like, and I made the comparable on Twitter, to Chris Tierney once upon a time. Chris Tierney was up with the Sharks, as was Bordalo. Played, was okay, but not really all that remarkable. Went to the Worcester Sharks at the time. There's a throwback. And when he got called back up in around February, was a completely different player and played extremely well. And I feel like with Thomas Bordalo, it's the same exact thing. Was in the NHL earlier this year. Not that remarkable. Goes back down. Comes up, as you pointed out, three of the last four goals for the Sharks have been scored by him. He's getting his shot off, which I love. Um, he doesn't appear to be uh, making a lot of turnovers, uh, or I should say as much turn- as many turnovers as he was making earlier in his career. And I'm, you know, one of the one of the Barracuda folks in this chat, maybe Ian can maybe confirm or deny this, but it doesn't seem like the pacing of the NHL is kind of weighing on him as much as it once was. Now, granted, two-game sample size, but if you're looking for something positive out of the situation, I think that would be it. Mm. I will take that. I mean, <laughs> you take what you can get at this point, and the, the bar is so goddamn low. <laughs> right. <sighs> so, again, not a great game for Eklund. One for seven in the dot. Uh, but they did get their first win in the Cali Finn jerseys after going 0-7, so we can knock off that narrative finally. And somehow the Senators have played 14 road games against Western Conference opponents and have lost every single one. I mean, again. I don't find that all that surprising. Yeah, but again, dude, <clears throat> your law of averages is getting shoved in its locker on the regular, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it seems, and I think this is kind of what what I've been talking about all season is how wide open uh, the playoff race this year is, this year is right? Like, it seems like the, if you want to say superstar teams, um, have kind of stepped backwards a little bit just in terms of how much they can get after people. Uh, Vegas, the Rangers, uh, Edmonton, L.A. come to my mind. Um, They've kind of taken a step back, whereas your middle class teams, you know, your teams that are going to make the playoffs, but maybe, maybe not. They're a cup contender. Winnipeg, Dallas, um, Tampa Bay, you know, are have kind of stepped up a little bit where between like the upper and middle classes of the NHL teams, it's very comparable. Right. And I feel like, you know, who uh, 
has to deal with that the most? Well, it's the lower class teams. And I feel like that's why you look at San Jose, you look at Chicago, Ottawa, Anaheim, like more often than not, those four teams in particular, Arizona as well, are getting beat up by really anybody who comes in. <laughs> no kidding. It's, it, it appears to me, and, and, and I'm curious if you agree, it appears to me that for these those really crappy teams that I mentioned, Chicago, San Jose, Anaheim, uh, I would even say Columbus and Ottawa as well. Mm-hmm. Seems like seems much more difficult to squeak out a win in this season's NHL. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, I'd give that. Whereas before, like even if you were complete dog shit, like you could you could convince me, like yeah, in any given moment, this team could win. And now I'm not so sure because, <laughs> <laughs> like, Especially who's going to score? Sh- yeah, well, especially with the Sharks, like how many times where it's like, again, you pointed out the law of averages, you know, like the law of averages says that the Sharks are not going to win or I'm sorry, not going to lose uh, 10 games in a row for like ever. And they did it twice this year, uh, almost did it a third time had they not won yesterday. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. Dude, laughs> so, they were knocking on that door. You know, I feel like it's a lot harder for these crappy teams to steal wins and be sort of the uh, uh, the spoiler, if you will, like stealing points from people. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Uh, was the uh, Women of Teal promotion, speaking of which, uh, the uh, Women of uh, Teal jersey promo that they did, uh, we might include <laughs> that in a, in a giveaway. What, what size is that, a medium or an XL? <laughs> uh, well... I have two. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, but they are both XL. Dude, how how freaking awesome is that logo? It's pretty awesome, but I love it. The uh, I guess for the people that were bidding on uh, or <laughs> those warm up jerseys, I guess they people didn't think it was that awesome because they had twenty six jerseys up for auction. Only three reached bids over fair market value. And as of this afternoon, just before it ended, uh, seven didn't even have bids. Oh man, it ended. I was gonna, I was gonna say I, uh, I was kind of thinking maybe I need to have a late snipe. Dude, uh, there. Yeah, you, they're all closed. Uh, check out the late. Last time when I checked it, like maybe an hour or so ago, I thought there was still one available that had not been bought. Oh, uh, Hoffman, buy now <laughs> for three fifty now. Uh, again, you you know my philosophy on these things. Like I'm, uh, you know, there is no player that's beneath me when it comes to the warm up jersey. Um, but <laughs> I I I would have liked maybe one of the generic ones. You know, the yep. one that says Sharks or the Create Your Own one. But uh, dude, I gotta be honest. Like I think this branding and and I think it's be. I mean, I love Sharks. I love California Golden Poppy Flowers as well. Like, I just think this is one of the, it might not be, like, overall, it might not be the best jersey the Sharks have ever done, but the logos are some of the coolest I've ever seen. And I, like, I wish it wasn't total, like, like nonsense to, like, Frankenstein one of these jerseys, because I would love to just have the patches as kind of their own little thing. All right. Well, you can always strip them back. Anyway. <laughs> but just to see that, over the course of this season, yeah, the auction jerseys, they just, man, they're not selling like they used to. So it's like, oh God, just just allow them to be worn. Anyway. All right. Well, you heard uh, you heard from Jewels and Puck Guy. You heard from Lacey, Mark, and Ian. Uh, now it's time for our takes on the uh, trades. Uh, blah, 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 blah. What, what just, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> where to start all right Duclair. Uh okay so on this one uh how you feeling Duclair goes along with a 2025 seventh round pick and in return san jose gets defenseman jack thompson and a 2024 third so get, picking up a third in this upcoming NHL draft and just to let you know Jack Thompson 21 year old right-handed defenseman and has already reported to the CUDA if I'm not mistaken had at least a point yesterday 
Yeah, uh, the two games he's played thus far, he's got he's got an assist in two games. All right. I you know you kind of have to look at this um, on on kind of a multiple levels because if you recall what uh, what was um, what it cost to get Duclair to begin with, it was uh, I believe Steve, Stephen Lawrence and I believe a fifth round pick. So if you kind of look at it from that, just from that deal versus this deal, obvious net positive for the Sharks, no matter what happens. Um, but I like getting Jack Thompson. I believe the point was made uh, by multiple people. So I'll kind of just, you know, ride their coattails. <laughs> the, the Sharks depth uh, on the right side of the blue line is brutal. It's it's insanely shallow, <laughs> I should say, not depth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the yeah, and and if you look on cap friendly, you know the the four guys that are designated as right handed uh, right D men I, uh, are all I believe left handed, or at the very <laughs> least, most of them are left handed. So I like bringing in Jack Thompson, if for no other reason than he's added depth to the right side of the blue line. But what I do like is. There is a little bit of uh, offensive craftiness there. You know, he's put up points uh, in every league that he's played in, um, whether it be the OHL, the AHL. Um, only has one NHL game and did not put up any points, but, you know, it's one game. And that's not to say that, like, this is the next Dan Boyle, Eric Carlson, Brent Burns, or anything like that. But for a guy who's only 21, why not? You know what I mean? Bring him in, see what you can do, see if he can be a fixture of the NHL lineup going forward, especially as you've pointed out, the sort of the uh, remaking of this team, uh, specifically on the blue line, probably needs to happen sooner rather than later. So why not remake it with a guy who's 21 and has got some upside? And as for the third round pick, I'll, I just I'll get a think it's always uh, good I'll... business. <laughs> wow. Hold on. Wow, that was okay. That wow. was really weird to go to hit one thing and everything like fired at once. Russian collusion, dude. Um, <laughs> the bots are back. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I think obviously with Thompson, it's a quality prospect to add, and then getting that third round pick. How many times have we said it? And I believe Mark said it as well uh, on the show on Friday. You take as many lottery tickets as you can get, and you just see what happens, right? And you know, I know the Sharks historically don't do very well in the third round, but there have been a lot of quality NHL players to come out of the third round. So you always want to take that chance. The one thing that we've neglected to say, mm -hmm. it, it, not that it will happen, but it could. Sure. Declare could also re-sign with the Sharks over the summer. I think it's, I'll be honest with you, I think now... Uh, now that Hurdle is gone, I do believe that it's less likely. But Hurdle's gone? It's, many people are saying, <laughs> dude. Uh, now that Hurdle's gone, I do believe it's less likely. But I do agree with you um, just because of... I, I know in, in past situations like this, the commentary on, oh, would you return? Um, it's always been kind of vague and sort of wishy-washy. And I feel like with Duclair's comments, you know, maybe you could argue that they were vague as well, but they did seem a bit more pointed. Um, so, I mean, maybe, as I said, less likely now that Hurdle's gone, but certainly not impossible. I mean, if he really felt like this is a good culture, and obviously he spent most of the year playing with Eklund and get, like getting to know Eklund, getting to know and play with Bordalo and Zetterlund. So, he, by all accounts, he's meshed with the right people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if he, if he were to do press and be like, yeah, you know, Mike Hoffman's my best friend, like probably not coming back. Yeah. But, but you know, the, I believe there was earlier in the, uh, earlier in the season, I believe he referred to Eklund jokingly, like as his son. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously as you saw from the comments on Friday, you know, had made it an, an impact on Thomas Bordalo. And so I'm, I, again, we'll see, but I do wonder if he is somebody who would come back and kind of be a quasi leader on the team, maybe wear an A on the jersey, be one of those veterans that the Sharks are going to need to help along all these young players. No doubt.
I like this comment from Chris only because I'm not sure where it's directed. <laughs> it says, can't get too many men on the ice if you're not on the ice. Now, I think that's directed at Clo, but it feels like it could be directed at LeBanc. Could be. Yeah. All right, uh, let's go. Shimmick. Now, this, <laughs> if, uh, if you remember a couple weeks ago, he was named captain for the Barracuda. And I remember being like, okay, because I didn't expect him to be around that long. So here we are. So, Trying to shine him up. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, Shimmick and the Devils 2024 seventh rounder that San Jose had goes to Detroit, and San Jose receives, uh, am I going to get this right, Clem Costin? Clem Costin, yep. Clem Costin, excuse me. So, it, it, who, who this, did play yesterday for, instead of LeBanc for the Sharks. <laughs> this one is kind of, this one's really interesting to me. I mean, I, I think it's good business solely for the reason that you traded away a guy who's going to be a free agent and brought in a guy who's under contract for next year. So, Right there, I think it's a win. You traded away a guy who was on your minor league team, and 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 you can't understate the value that Shimmick brought to the Barracuda, but he was on the Barracuda. Mm -hmm. And you bring in Clem Costin, who is in the NHL lineup and has kind of, despite being a thirty, uh, you know, a first round pick uh, six years ago, has struggled to make noise in the NHL, but had a good season with the Oilers last year and. Uh, from what I saw talking to an Oilers fan saying, you know, Costin had a good year with the Oilers and then chased the money to Detroit and didn't have a good year. So is this another was, reclamation project for Greer? Uh, I don't know that it's a reclamation project because there was like, there's nothing really remarkable to try and get back to. I think it's more trying to see, okay, this guy's played well. Can we maybe get him along? All right. You know, and, and and we'll see. You know, I think at this point, being being a first round pick seven years ago by the time the next draft is, I think it's unlikely that he's going to hit the ceiling that a 31st overall player would hit. But that's not to say that he can't be an effective player. I mean, as I said last year with the Edmonton Oilers, 11 goals. If you're going to get 11 goals from your fourth line, that's really good. All right. The definitely one that no one saw coming. <laughs> Uh, a Hochuk. To... Yeah, that one was interesting. <laughs> he goes to the Flames for merely a 2024 fifth rounder. San Jose will receive the highest of Chicago's selection at the time of the draft at the Blackhawks' own. Um, <laughs> considering where the Blackhawks are going to finish, I think we know which one of that it's going to be. <laughs> um, and Nikita came over in the Meyer deal, yes? Yes, correct. So that that does this now make the Meyer deal look a little less than? Uh, no. Be, if anything, if anything, because you're trading away a piece of that trade for a draft pick. If anything, it extends the sort of observation window of the Meyer trade, because um, you never know who the Sharks could end up picking with that fifth round selection. Um, but for me, I kind of think this is a trade where. Calgary probably looked at a Hotuk and said, hey, this is a guy who might be something. And San Jose probably said, we've got a million and one left-handed defenseman. Let's clear it out a little bit. <laughs> well, and I like Calgary. Hey, this guy might be somebody. Let's remedy that. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, Los Gatos native. Devin Cooley. I know a lot of people. Who? Uh, I so Go ahead. I thought this one, I thought this one was more more fun than anything else. Like as you <laughs> as you mentioned, the Lost Gaddis native, right? He hasn't had really the most spectacular numbers um, the last few years. You have to go back to, I mean, unless you look at the ECHL, but you know, <laughs> like you really have to go back to when he was at the University of Denver to see a quality body of work, right? And you know, that could be a product of just playing on some brutal AHL teams. So we'll kind of see where that goes from. That. I mean, he's a, you know, he is a goalie, which generally take longer to mature than players do, but he is also 26. So definitely in the we'll see territory. Um, 
Well, but I if mean, he ends if he ends up being a goalie for the uh, uh, if he ends up being a quality goalie for the Barracuda, like you still need that just for organizational health, right? So yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, and it wasn't too long ago. It felt like you know all your goalies are belong to us. Sure. Uh, so what's another one? Because let's be honest, none of them have really grabbed the brass ring. None of them, you know, really stood out. I mean, and then hell, we had. Uh, who was the cat that um, that the Sharks drafted and then he like saw the log jam and was like, oh, you know, I think I'm going to re-enter and then nobody took his ass? Oh, Was, was uh, that Bo Pitt or Godro or who was that? I think it was, I think it was Godro. <laughs> Dear and, Lord. You know, before we get to the next trade, I do just want to make a comment on these four. So Duclair, Shimmick, Ohotuk, and the Cooley trade. I think, <laughs> and obviously this is not what happened, but, <laughs> what happened was, but I think if the trade deadline stopped after those four trades, I think you could give you could confidently give Mike Greer a a B plus or an A minus. I think he loses points for not getting Barabanov moved, but in terms of the moves actually completed up to that point, I think are all quality moves, and they're not sexy, but they're quality, and maybe they could be something someday. So I think everything up to that point. You're, you'd be hard pressed to give him anything lower than a B plus. Yeah. Well. Um. And then who? Who's... And I, I purposely said it before the next two you're going to show us. <laughs> <laughs> well, and who's the cat from the the goalie from Gilroy that everybody wanted a couple? Uh, Dustin Dustin Wolf, which is really frustrating because if you ask me and you ask Kevin Lacey and you ask Ian and Mark and all these guys, uh. There, there, There is no revisionist history on Dustin Wolf. That is who the Sharks should have taken in 2019, and they just fumbled it. <sighs> well, so, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. Let me let you know. All right, so speaking of goaltenders, all right, what are we uh, – how are you feeling about this? The Sharks send to New Jersey, Capo Kakinen, mm -hmm. receive back a 2025th seventh-round pick. Did, did that end up going somewhere else in part of one of the other deals? Uh, no. Um, I get so confused. <laughs> well, because the so the the pick that the Sharks traded in the Clem Costin deal was the Devils' 2024 seventh. Ah, there you, thank you. Jesus yeah. Christ, I'm trying to keep up with all this. All right, so, uh, so so figure this out for me. Make it make sense. So basically, somehow, like over the course of the last eighteen months. The Sharks said those goalies for New Jersey will take all of them. Yeah, I mean, it, Vanacek it, and Blackwood now. It's really it's it's really kind of interesting for me for for many reasons. I'm going to attack this from all angles. So as, as has been long discussed, right? Teams generally, and I even said this a couple weeks ago. Teams generally don't rebuild their goaltending on the fly. Let me rephrase. Good teams don't <laughs> generally rebuild their goaltending on the fly. And so, yes, the New Jersey Devils, I believe, as things stand right now, they're not currently in a playoff spot. They are... The hell you say? Was yeah, it, Wasn't they Timo are, supposed to fix that? Right. They're, they're currently six points out of a playoff spot, but by no means, I would say, are they out of things, you know? Uh, it's going to take a lot, but they're still there. And so you are six points out of a playoff spot, and it's not guaranteed that you're going to make the playoffs, and you completely rebuild your goaltending. You trade away Vitek Vanacek, who granted he's hurt, so kind of doesn't really matter. Um, but you, So you bring in Capo Kakinen, and you bring in Jake Allen, so that leads me to believe that New Jersey thinks with stable goaltending they can go on a run and make the playoffs. And it is kind of interesting you know, I think if the deal was just Capo Kakinen for a seventh, I, I don't know that I would be in love with it, but I would say, well, he's battled inconsistency. You take what you can get and whatever, right? But to bring Vitek Vanacek over, who's not going to play this year and will hopefully play next year, I think from the Sharks' perspective, similar to Kakinen, similar to Mackenzie Blackwood, similar to a lot of the goalies who've been brought in the last few years, you hope that he's a goalie of the future or you rehab his image enough to trade him away. Well, and... And let me ask you this. Yeah. <laughs> ask it. 
why would you get Vanacek if you didn't think he was playing next season? Exactly. Unless, I mean, and the thing is, like, it, I think you make a really good point because because he's done for this season, New Jersey could have put him on long-term injury reserve and not even had to worry about it. And so... Did you say the, LTIR? <laughs> I know. That's a taboo phrase right now. And so the, fa- the fact that they... The, the the fact that they could have put him on LTIR and they didn't, I, I, I do kind of, it does make me think if they just wanted a different look in net, right? And you talk about a guy who's been like hot and cold, like was solid for the Capitals, got claimed by Seattle in the expansion draft and, and Washington wanted him back so much that they traded for him. And then he ends up getting flipped to New Jersey for a pretty decent penny from what I understand. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, devils, the Devils moved down in the second round and gave up a third round to get Vitek Vanacek. And then 18 months later, they give him away for a seventh and a UFA goalie. Or they, I'm sorry, they yeah give him up with a seventh for a UFA goalie. So you, you talk about fumbling the bag on that one. Well, um, and they gave the Sharks, you know, it was basically a goalie swap, but, you know, the New Jersey also gave up a pick to sweeten right. it. So right. it makes you wonder where New, what New Jersey thinks of Vanacek and what he's going to, uh, <laughs> how much he'll be playing next season. I don't know. Well, I, I, I think New Jersey is playing 4D chess and they're trying to, you know, they bring in Capo Kakinen, they bring in Jake Allen. They're trying to make it to the end of the year and maybe push for a playoff spot. I'm firmly of the belief that in the summer they're going to be hunting after, I mean, take your pick, you know, Jacob Markstrom, UC Soros, one of those guys. And so I think bringing in Capo Kakinen is Kakinen, and I think it's a stopgap. And Jake Allen, I think, is he'll be the starter right now, but next year is going to be the backup to whatever big fish they bring in. And so I think it was a matter of just making room, especially because Vanacek has next year under contract at just under three and a half million. But I mean, it's an opportunity for the Sharks to either find a quality goalie of the future or of the now. Um, and if not, same thing with Capo Kakinen. You just flip him a year down the road and try and get something out of it. So I I kind of look at it as no harm, no foul. Honestly, the biggest glitch I have with this whole trade is the fact that, and it's not anybody's fault, but the fact that in giving up Jake Middleton for Capo Kakinen, you would have liked Kakinen to... You would have liked Kakinen to continue the strong level of play that he had in Minnesota in San Jose. Yeah. And well, so I think it kind of sucks from that perspective. Because well, he was both in Minnesota, Kakinen was very good. And then, I don't know, the wheels just kind of blew off of it. <laughs> well, d- just we could have avoided all of this if the Sharks had just done what you said and got Swayman. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got to move on to the last one. So thank you very much, Mitya, coming in hot on the Super Chat. Fun must be always. Not anymore, yeah. apparently. <laughs> apparently. I'm going to let it go. All right, a hurdle. All right, so the Sharks get David Enstrom center, and I believe what was Vegas's top overall uh, prospect um no he I mean, oh he really their, we didn't even get that huh great <laughs> yeah he edstrom was their first round pick in 2023 um i i was kind of in, in trading hurdle i was really expecting like i was really thinking like okay like if we're trading away hurdle like this is gotta this trade has got to bring brendan Brisson back and it didn't so mm. that's that's kind of shitty right off the start brendan Brisson, by the way former teammate of Thomas Bordalo, so that would have been a lot of fun. Oh, that would have. So the details on this, Sharks get center David Edstrom and the Golden Knights 2025 first round pick. Now, Mm -hmm. if Vegas does what Vegas tends to do, that first round selection, going to be on the low side. So that's a bit of a kick in the dick. I'm not totally sure I agree with – well, let me rephrase. I, I do agree with what you're saying, but I don't agree that it's absolute. I'm not saying it's absolute, but you know what I mean. Because I'm just saying you you look at the Vegas Golden Knights. They 
they are going to be in a pretty interesting situation next season trying to build a roster. And, you know, we saw a little bit this year where they win the cup last year and then have a bit of a speed wobble this year, not doing so hot. They bring in Hurdle, they bring in Mantha, they bring in Noah Hannafin, all awesome pieces to bring in. I'm kind of wondering if because of the salary cap and because of who's a free agent and who's not, I'm kind of wondering if this is it for Vegas. And then, you know, it it almost it almost has me feeling a little bit of a way with Carlson. You know, like Eric Carlson went to Pittsburgh to go chase the cup. Mm-hmm. Last time I looked, Pittsburgh, not in the playoff picture. Not even close. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, could you imagine if Hurdle goes to Vegas to chase the cup and it's basically only for this season? And last I looked, they were in the second wild card position. Yeah. Uh, as things stand right now, Vegas is. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Second wild card position, which I, I'm pretty confident that they will remain there because the team immediately behind them is six points back. But. You never know. I mean, they are also only one point out of third in the division. So, what, what if this was 4D chess and Hurdle was like, you know what? I can't help San Jose win, but I can go to Vegas and help them lose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, like, and even even going into next year, right? Like, Vegas is still going to have a lot of quality pieces on their roster, but I'm just wondering. With the salary cap being what it is, with the injuries, with the guys who need new contracts, I do wonder if this is kind of it. And then not to say that Vegas is going to be in the cellar by any stretch, but maybe, I don't know, I, I, I could see 2025, 2026 kind of be like a reset year, you know, just because they have pushed all their chips in the middle of the table now two years in a row and, you know, We'll see. That's not to say that 2025 first is going to be first overall or anything, but I don't think it's guaranteed that it'll be 32nd overall is all I'm saying. Yeah, <clears throat> but we'll see. I mean, Ian saying it's a glorified second. That was the kind of the way I was leaning as well. And then, you know, because the funny thing about this is if you go back and listen to uh, Puck Guy and Jules, when this trade initially came down, I can't remember who it was, if it was Panyota or Friedman or or wasn't it somebody who like came out of fucking retirement to break this deal? Yeah, it was Bob McKenzie. Yeah, so Bobby Mack throws this up and initially when it first came out, it was being understood by most people that the Sharks for Tomas Hurdle was getting David Edstrom the Knights 2025 first round, their 2025 third round, and their 2027 third round. That would make more sense. <laughs> yeah. And so to see, I think, like, look, Hurdle had a fat deal. He was, you know, making over eight, and he had, so he's got like six years left, dude. Yeah. And, and it, it's six years after this year. Yeah. And so you have all of that. And, you know, the hurdle had the full no move, so he was going to control where he was going to go. I mean, yeah, it's a kick in the dick that it go that it's Vegas. You know, it's like, it's, if you've ever seen Indiana Jones, it's like, you know, Vegas. Why did it have to be Vegas? Right. But looking at those, I just, I kind of sit there and I go, look, I understand this deal had to get done. That being said, on its surface, it does feel a little like, Greer overpaid, but his options were severely limited. And it's, uh, I think this is about probably your second favorite player. Really? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a part of it. Um, cap space, right. And getting assets for, I mean, they got quality assets. Like, you know, the, you always take first round picks. No, I hate, and you know, not to dunk on anybody, but I hate when people say, Oh, it's a glorified second. Because you can find quality talent in the first round if you know what you're doing. And David Enstrom, people are going to look at the stats and say, oh, my God, he's playing with Frolanda and he's not doing so great and blah, 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 blah. All you need to do is you need to listen to the Teal Tinted Glasses from Friday and they'll let you know that Edstrom spent most of the season playing on the fourth line or as, a, as the extra forward. And only in the last three or four weeks has he been in the top six. And, oh. Interesting. Most of his points have come in the last three or four weeks. So <laughs> I'm just saying, again, as I said at the top, it's sad. Be sad. Be upset. This is still the right move to make. Well, and the thing that I hate the most about the deal 
it's not going to Vegas. It's not having to give up a you know some a couple thirds. It's it's the salary retention. You know, like I would love to just have it just a clean break. Sure. And can we just talk about the you know elephant in the room for a minute? Uh, I think we're probably both on the same page when it comes to this. It was a mistake to sign Hurdle in the first place two years ago. Yeah, I I would agree with that. And and Ian made the point on Twitter is like this all funnels back to two years ago when Joe Will was the interim GM Who? and had and and had the had the authority to sign Hurdle to an extension when maybe it would not have been the smartest thing. I mean, definitely from yeah. But uh, tell me, tell me, Joe Will, tell me that he didn't like totally walk into that situation with you know what would Doug Wilson do? Because <laughs> that was a total Doug Wilson contract, dude. Right. Well, but the thing is, is like, that's where all this stems from. Like, don't be pissed at Mike Greer. Be pissed at Joe Will. Joe Will should have either. I mean, it's one of two things, right? Joe Will should have either traded Hurdle back when he was a pending UFA and only making, I think, five and a quarter million. And (sighs) there were teams and Vegas was interested and the Rangers were interested and Dude, I uh, remember Flor- us, Florida was interested. I remember us talking about this back then and because we were like rubbing our hands together going, can you imagine what the return for Hurdle could be? Right. You know, like and- we thought, I remember at one point saying to myself, like, you know, could this be like the inverse of the Carlson deal or something close? Right. I mean, because and- dude, Hurdle, it was in his pri- 27 years old. Well, and and I th- and I remember I said it on the podcast at the time two years ago. I said Tomas Hurdle re-signing with the Sharks means that he saw the roadmap and he liked where things are going. And then <laughs> D- Doug Wilson resigns. Joe Will does not get the general manager job on a full time basis. Mike Greer comes in, and Mike Greer says, "Fuck this roadmap." And so <sighs> I think. I think with, with and granted hindsight is twenty twenty and nobody knows like at the time you know at that time that the hurdle extension was signed I don't know that it was even on the table whether or not um, whether or not Doug Wilson was going to resign but if there was even an inkling of that maybe you just really kind of do your due diligence on everything and maybe as they're pointing out in the chat maybe if you're the owner. Maybe you say, hey, I know you're the interim GM right now, but chances are we're going to need a new GM and it's probably not going to be you. So <laughs> maybe don't do this. <sighs> well, and I go back to the uh, the Bill Walsh rule, you know, better to dump a player a year too early and not a year too late. <sighs> oh, my God. I will say Mac, these max terms to me that Doug Wilson hand out, starting with Burns, have just really play the game. Oh, I know, but ugh. so who do you know? But, I, well, well, no, I want to I want to comment on that because the thing is, and and I'm not saying that you shouldn't hate them because I think they are very very dicey. But imagine the alternative reality where Doug Wilson says eight years, no shot, goodbye, Brent Burns. Uh, eight years, no shot, goodbye, Eric Carlson. Goodbye, uh, you know, all these players. Goodbye, Logan Couture. Goodbye, Tomas Hurdle. Goodbye, Timo Meyer. Right, like. <laughs> the fact is, like, the Sharks in that time from 2016 to 2019 were a legitimate cup contender. And if the Sharks start saying, eight years, hell no. We'll take our chances in the bargain bin. They're going to miss the playoffs every year, and people are going to be yelling and screaming, why did we let Brent Burns go? Why did we let Martin Jones go? Whatever you want to say about Martin Jones now, at the time, that signing was based in logic. And so I under like, hating long-term deals, 100%. I understand it and I support it. But this idea that I've seen people on like Reddit and Facebook have is like, oh, the Sharks should just never sign long-term deals. Well, then the Sharks are never going to have any quality free agents and not build a quality team. So, well, And, the, and the, the ironic part of all of that is the one player that they wouldn't give an extra year to. Yeah, but even that was ba- <laughs> even that was based in logic. Like, no, I get yeah. it. It was it's you know it's just the idea of like you get eight years, you get eight years, you get eight years. What you want three? Fuck off. <laughs> yeah, and I and I think 
I don't know. I, I think with that one in particular, like, I think because I think if it was any other player, um, I think it was any if it was any other player, you say if you want your three years, go somewhere else. But I think because of who it was, I kind of think you have to do the three years and then suck it up if things go sideways, which the odds said that things were going to go sideways if it was if that three or third year deal came across the table. Like, make no mistake, Pavelski's having an awesome career post San Jose, and we are all psyched for him, but Anybody who acts like they knew this was going to happen are complete frauds. Yeah, but again, it's it's just it, like just taking the names out of it. It's mm-hmm. just funny that you get eight years, you get eight years, you know. But oh, you want three? Kiss my ass. Right. Who do you think? I, oh, go ahead. No, and I and I kind of think like again, it is it is playing the game, right? Like if you want, you know, if you want quality players, you have to give them a reason to stay. That's how business works, right? Oh, but and, it, and how much money did they say that Hurdle was going to save just from moving to Nevada, tax wise? Oh, oh yeah, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a good chunk because it's like an extra the, year of a contract. Well, because the and and cap friendly, they have a calculator for this. So the state income tax in California, I believe, is eleven percent in Nevada. Of your it's income zero. in Nevada, it's zero, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let me see. Total... You know, speaking of which, can I use your address to file my income tax? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that right now. So, uh, let me see. It's gotta be close to like, just, oh. So hurdle in, and, and let's just assume. The chat is this... saying six mil, which again, it's like, it's, it's basically, especially when you, factor in the uh, retained salary it's like a, well, it's, he's saving a year's worth yeah so it, had he finished the year in san jose uh he would have he would have netted uh, his net salary would have been 4.78 million and uh in if he spends the whole year in vegas which obviously he's not going to this year uh the net salary is 5.9 million so just over a million bucks extra money that he's holding on to Whew. All right. Well, who who gets his A at this point? I mean, is there a more obvious choice than Granlin? Well, Granlin's already got. So when everybody was banged up, it was Ferraro. Because you keep in mind, Hurdle hasn't been playing for a while. Mm-hmm. So it's already been Granlin, Cunnan, and Ferraro in the interim. But I think going forward, now that like now that the guy who was an alternate is not just unhealthy, he's gone. I think Grandlin probably is the logical option there just because he's going to be here next year and he's already wearing one. And he's um, also been like one of the most consistent guys. Yeah, he's been yeah, extremely consistent, extremely good. Um I'm and I know you'll agree with me, I'm not against giving it to Nico Sturm. That I was going to say to me that was like my dark horse pick. I thought it would have I like Granlund, I think you can make an argument for Granlund. Conan, though, I'm like, no. Conan? And, and and maybe maybe there's some kind of off-ice element that we just don't see. Maybe that's part of it. But I'm kind of shocked that Nico Sturm, with how, to your point, with how transparent and how upfront he is with the media, I'm surprised he doesn't already have one. Yeah, I was going to say, he, he tends to, it feels like he tends to set the tone a lot of the time. And right. I could see him totally getting a letter, especially... Uh, I could see him getting a C if Couture isn't ends up being not healthy enough to return. God forbid. I would be more inclined to agree with you. Agree with you if he had more than next year under his under his contract. I do wonder if, and I don't know that I'm necessarily in love with this idea, but I do wonder if, say, let's just say for argument's sake, say Couture he has to retire or he never plays again or whatever the story is, right? It would not at all surprise me to see kind of a committee leadership approach. And then when the Sharks are ready to compete, that's when you designate who your captain is. And that's and that's a thing that has happened. I mean, uh, Edmonton did that. Like, McDavid didn't get the C until his second year in the Oilers. You know, the first year was a committee. Mm-hmm. And, well, you, you got to rebuild that culture as well. Right. And, and it was a similar thing, uh, a similar thing with the Vancouver Canucks. A uh, similar thing with the New York Rangers. New York Rangers are actually a really good example where you kind of have a lead. The Rangers had like seven alternate captains and it was kind of ridiculous. <laughs> but but eventually they got to a point where they were a contender and they said, OK, this is our captain. And 
we're going to move forward from there. So I, the current, the, the, the next captain of the sharks after Couture, I'm not going to say that he's not on the team, but he's not somebody who's going to get the C immediately after Couture relinquishes it, I guess is my point. See, I, I think it's going to end up being Ferraro. If he, if Ferraro is still here, I'm not saying that, you know, that I endorse that. I'm just saying, yeah, you know, I mean, but being a leader, it's half off ice, half on ice. And I feel like Ferraro really only has the off ice part down. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. I just I just don't want to go back to that bullshit where, you know, we had, the, the, the Sharks had a captain and then there were like the road alternates and the home alternates. You know, they had five different guys wearing letters. It's like, just, dude, just the three is fine. That's all you uh, I, 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 I'm kind of I'm kind of of the different mind on that. Like, I don't really... I don't think it really matters, right? I think having a expanded leadership group, I really feels like is it, I think, you know, I think certain there are certain certain elements of that where it's valued, right? Because if you're, I mean, think back to 2020, right? Granted, the sharks were brutal at that time, but just think about it when there was optimism, right? It's like say you're a free agent or a guy who's traded for, and you're like, man, Couture's the captain, and then we got Hurdle and Burns. And Eric Carlson, all wearing alternates, like what a team this is. You know what I mean? <laughs> so the the optics of it, you know, there there is some value in the optics. Yeah. Well, let's let's get into the notable FAs that were not moved. Uh, Kevin LeBanc. I mean, it's hard to find a market for somebody who cr- who can't crack this fucking lineup. The time to trade him was a year ago because a based on the stats, and we broke this down a year ago. Based on the stats. He had a direct comparable that was traded for a second round pick. The time to do it was last year. Dude, the time to do it was after game seven. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Did someone say game seven? <laughs> uh, another notable FA not moved. Uh, you brought his name up a couple minutes ago, Mike Hoffman. I mean, yeah. who, why would there be a market for this guy? Yeah, I mean, especially coming coming over from Montreal. He really had an opportunity. I talked about earlier about uh, rehabbing your image. He had an opportunity to rehab his image on the Sharks and get dealt to a contender, and he squandered it. Do, I mean, it's just you, you found a way to trade him the first time he was a Shark. <laughs> well, the first time he was a Shark, he was, like, really, really good. Uh, dude, Barabanov. I mean, this was the one that we all expected. Like, we didn't see a ho coming, but Barabanov, we all thought, oh, fate to complete, said he wanted to go to a contender. I mean, who doesn't? And Sup- Shang supposedly was told that he would go to a contender. Yeah. Well, and then Shang put out a, something earlier today, I think, that said he was almost dealt to the Rangers. Uh, I think the Oilers were sniffing, and there might have been one or two other that yeah. were kind of sniffing around. The, av- the Avalanche were all over him early in the season. So it really makes you wonder how the hell did, I mean, you got all these other deals made. How does this not go through? I yeah. just, man, I don't get and it. And I think, especially because, you know, assuming, assuming the reports are true, you know, he was told that he was going to be dealt and he wasn't. So I have to think at this point, like he's, going to be moving on to another team like after that you know oh yeah and remember this is a team now this might have been with a different group i i'm trying to remember but what was that shit that that shimmick went through a couple seasons ago or whatever he, he like told the beat writers or whatever that he felt lied to um i think it has to do with uh what he was told his role was going to be mm. <sighs> Either way, I mean, dude, everybody knows we were uh, big Barbie guys early on and have been for, for most well, of the time. Uh, I, I want to I comment on something Skyler said. So Skyler pointing out the Sharks didn't have a retention slot, which, yes, that's true. But I do not believe for one second that a lack of a retention slot is what prevented him being traded because – he makes two and a half million dollars. There were players who make more money that got traded with no retained salary. Yep. So I'm not I'm not buying it. Uh Bailey. Yeah. I wouldn't be <laughs> you know, I him and uh him and Carpenter, I would not at all be surprised if they're both re signed uh, and come back next year. To, for the CUDA. Yeah. Yeah. 
warm bodies. Uh, what about Limblom? Well, when you're worth nothing, I mean, <laughs> I'm saying. But again, it. same same thing, you know. If, and, and I think maybe Lindblom. I mean, the problem with Lindblom is like the injuries have been tough, right? Um, but I think I don't know. I do wonder, you know. I do wonder if he's kind of reached the end of his rope, you know. And I I do wonder if he's going to go back to the Swedish Hockey League at this point. Yeah, I think it's probably the best for all parties involved. So. I mean, look, ugh, it's been uh, basically about two seasons of Greer. I mean, he's moved Burns, he's moved Carlson, Meyer, Hurdle. I mean, he's he's literally moved the four biggest names on the team outside of Couture. Uh, you know, and I'm like, hey, you know what? Hey, let's sign Thornton and Marlowe against just so you can dump those guys <laughs> and fire Navi and Ricci while you're at it. Uh, how do you like, I mean, what do you think of the Greer move so far between, you know, Burns, Carlson, Meyer, and now Hurdle? Well, and I think we may have talked about this over the summer when we did the Eric Carlson trade reaction. But if you, the Greer trades, they're not <laughs> they're not sexy right off the top. Well, it's but, the whole thing, too, of, you know, if, if you're going to rebuild, you have to rebuild. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't be half in, half out. And I think... If you kind of, um, you know, like I said, the the the, um, the Greer trades, they're not sexy right off the top. But if you let them, if you let them breathe a little bit, and you kind of maybe let the emotions cool down for a second, and then take a step forward and look at it, I think not to say that he hasn't had some duds because he has, but I would say if you look at his trades, they're mostly good. I would say. I mean. The Jacob Magna trade comes to mind. Great move. The uh, the Brent Burns one, not great, but considering the contract, you did the best you could. Same thing with Eric Carlson, which the Eric Carlson one, I mean, I was optimistic of that of that one as soon as it came down, but I, I really feel good about that one just because... <laughs> Dude, if they stay right where they're at, uh, you know, for another month or so. Right, and chances are, with Mikhail Granlin specifically... One of two things is going to happen. He's either going to get traded away, and that's going to be more assets, or he's going to re-sign with the Sharks and be a focal point of the rebuild going forward, which there's value in that. Too. I was going to say, I, I, I'm happy to go either way on that. Yeah, me too. Um, Let me ask you a quick question. Sure. Did you think there was even the slightest chance that somebody might have made a phone call about Philip Zadina? Hmm. Uh, I, I wanna, mean, I wanna... all of the sudden, all of the sudden, he's tied his career high in goals. Yeah, but again, I think there's just uh, an overall One lack more of chance. One <laughs> more chance. An <laughs> overall lack of consistency. Uh, what do uh, what do the Sharks have left? Like nineteen? How many games? Are you, are you talking about games? Yeah, nineteen. I want to. This is the thing. Now that all that shit, you know, the the trade deadline and all that stuff, and it's like. Is this team worse <laughs> following the deadline? I would say on paper, yes. Let's well, see when you trade when you trade your best forward. Yeah, but let's see uh, how guys like Zadina show up for these mm -hmm. last nineteen. Let's call them completely meaningless games. Mm -hmm. Like, show me something. Show me that you're you know that you want to be part of the solution. Show me that you have value. Yeah. So that's that's what I want to see. I mean, I think, I mean, we kind of talked about it a week ago. Like, what would it take for him to get another chance? Like, I'm kind of, I, I think I've made my decision and I think you give him one more chance. I mean, again, he's, again, yes. Former sixth overall pick and to your point has battled inconsistency this season. But, Despite battling inconsistency, despite bouncing around the lineup, despite being injured, he's tied his career high in goals. There's value there. You know what I mean? Well, and not only that, like if you can get him to to do what a one a one year deal. Yeah, it would be probably a one year deal, maybe the same amount of money, maybe a little bit less. Yeah. So if I, if he can do that, I'd say absolutely because honestly, next season is also going to suck. Mm hmm. So it's just kind of like, what do you have to lose? See, you know, if it works out, he's he's young. He's somebody that can be part of the solution. Or, uh, you know, if it gets to 
you know, some, I mean, who the hell knows what this off is going to look like. Maybe he's something that has value down the road, but. And, and that's, and that's the thing, either he's part of the solution or you didn't pay any assets to get him. So you just let him go. Yeah, exactly. So, and I know a lot of people are, uh, like I said, some of the, some of the nonsense that I've seen. And again, everybody's entitled their, to their opinion. Uh, I, you know, I, and I'm entitled to not agree with it. Uh, not everything is for everybody, but my take, and again, if you want to agree or disagree, that really doesn't you know, bother me, but a lot of people want to blame Wilson or Joe will, and that's fine. I think they, they definitely have some of the blame, but, uh, I want to blame an owner and a front office that allowed the draft and development staff to go 10 years. Uh, seemingly unaccountable because I, I, I did the, I ran the numbers over the course of those 10 years between 2010 and 2019, the sharks took 65 players in the draft guys that are still playing in the NHL. There's 13 of them, which is not a horrible, you know, percentage, but guys that are still on the sharks out of the 65, two, and one of them is LeBanc, who we all know is gone. Right. So to go for, you know, I'm not counting 2020 and beyond because let's be, you know, you still got a couple of years before we can really judge those. But holy shit, dude, that is a remarkable lack of success to still be employed. And I think if you're if you're an owner and your priority is winning, which the Sharks owner's priority is winning, mm-hmm. I think you ha- I think you have to go to Doug Wilson uh, and say, hey. Why are other teams around us getting backfill from guys they drafted and we're not? We yeah. still have picks, so what's happening? Yeah, why like why is this so bad? Now, you know, granted, they had, you know, there was one draft in there that was uh that was pretty decent. Uh, I'm trying to think of which one was that 2016? Um the 2017 uh draft for the Sharks was really good, but even then, like Majority of those players aren't even with the Sharks. So good at the time, yeah, but it's not worked out the way that, you know, everybody expected it to. 2019, I believe, was solid as well. Yeah, but it's just, I mean, to to 65. Now, granted, some people, you know, that were picked were moved out for other pieces and blah, blah, blah. They were used as capital and currency. I, I understand that. I get that point. But if you did it. You know, if you did the shit right, you these are players that you want on your team being productive, successful guys to sit there after 10 years and have one left after this season. Mm-hmm. Ooh, how are these people still employed? So anyway, uh, <clears throat> it was reported Hurdle is ahead of schedule, so he should be ready for the postseason in Vegas. Uh, of course, everybody believes that Stone will be. Uh, do you want to explain how, no, how no, whining about no. LTIR works? Well, <laughs> I, I want to jump. I want to jump in. It's actually quite the opposite. So, there is a chance Stone doesn't even play this year at all. Oh, okay. They've ch- switched that up, eh? No, I don't think that it's been switched up. I think people, to your point, people are stupid, and they just as- <laughs> and there's and they just assume that there's shenanigans going on. Uh, who was there? Was some? Was it Ryan Whitney? Something Whitney was talking about, like, oh my god, Vegas is getting away with murder with LTIR and blah blah blah. I'm like, oh my god. <sighs> here's the thing. Here's the thing. The Vegas and Tampa Bay have done this. Yep. And everybody is bitching and screaming about it. But, but, uh, but hold here's... on. Is it 30 other teams th- th- saying, are they bitching and screaming that Tampa and Vegas are doing this? Or are they bitching and screaming that they didn't think to do it first? Well, it is that. But it also, let's look at this. So, you know who else has done this? Carolina did it. The Rangers did it. Vancouver did it. Winnipeg did it. Dallas did it. What's the difference between those five teams I just mentioned and Vegas and Tampa? I want to say that Vegas and Tampa won cups. Right. And especially, dude, you know, and and I shouldn't be surprised because of where it is, but you know the loudest, the loudest crying on this LTI issue has come from Toronto. Which is <laughs> which is hilarious to me because first Oops, of all, because Tampa Bay keeps kicking their ass. <laughs> well, no, not even that. It's hilarious to me because not only are they doing it, 
this year, literally this year, but they've also done it in the past far more egregiously than Vegas and Tampa Bay did. Vegas and Tampa Bay, by all accounts, have not purposely left a healthy player on LTIR and pretended like they don't exist. <laughs> Toronto did that. Look, Joffrey Lupel, look it up. <laughs> so I <sighs> I just think it's like so mind-numbing that the loudest yelling and screaming comes from the team that's arguably complete, committed the most egregious misstep on this front. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. But that's the Maple Leafs culture for you is yelling and screaming when things don't go your way and then talking about how awesome you are when it does. Well, d tell me that Steve Dangle hasn't whined about this. I don't even know who that is. Oh, okay. Uh, Couture <laughs> came out and said he's out for the season. Dude, I got to be honest. This I'm like wondering if he's out for the season or if he's out for the remainder of his contract. Like, did we see Logan Couture play hockey for the last time? I don't know, man. This... It sounds like whatever this, you know, groin injury is, they just, they can't figure it out. I don't know if he, if dude needs to see a specialist, what they need to do to fix this, but man, when you, it, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, it, somebody just comes along and goes, watch this, you know, while, while I'm squeezing you by the balls, I'm going to give you a titty twister on top of it. Like, it's just, oh, man. Are we all still paying for the hand pass from Timo Meyer? Is that what it is? Uh, I No, because St. Louis <laughs> won the Stanley St. Louis not only ended up winning that series, they won the Stanley Cup. I know, so but it just seemed like ever since that fucking hand pass, it's like everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. <laughs> I don't know what it yeah, is. Yeah, or... I mean, it it is possible, hear me out, it is possible that there is some real-world reason for that. Not from the land of make-believe. Mm, true. Um, and Ian pointing out, I, I'm assuming this is on Logan's injury, you don't fix it, you manage it. And it's like, uh, well, if you can't manage to fix it, or fix to manage, either way, dude, I'm just nervous that... Let me ask you this. Say Couture never plays again and he just lives on uh lives on LTIR. Mhm. Mm you think there's a team out there that would trade for his contract? Uh, I'm going to say yes cuz I'll tell you what man if <laughs> Would it I'll be Toronto? You, <laughs> well, and here's the thing. Now granted the salary cap is is expected to go up really aggressively the next 2 years. <laughs> and like it, and isn't isn't a boy from Ontario? Yes. <laughs> Let, so, it, let it be Toronto. <laughs> so the salary cap is the salary cap is going to go up four million dollars to next season, and then four and a half million dollars two seasons from now. So that's eight and a half million dollars of growth in two years, which is behind the schedule, but just within that two year window is huge growth. So it's huge. Maybe, maybe the LTIR stuff. I mean, you have to understand most of this LTIR star, our stuff started happening when the cap was flat because of COVID. So teams have to get creative in order to make things work. So maybe when the cap goes up aggressively these next two years, it won't be a thing anymore. But let's just assume that it is a thing. It mm -hmm. is going to be a thing. I think if you're Vegas or Tampa or Colorado or Vancouver or the Rangers or Toronto or Winnipeg or Dallas or Florida, notice how I listed a shitload of teams. <laughs> like if you're one of those teams and you see Logan Couture never going to play again, $8 million on the LTIR, what's it going to take? You know what I mean? <laughs> Man, because you're not a good GM if you don't make that phone call and ask. Oh, dude, absolutely. Um, Mackenzie Blackwood likely to be back soon. Um, uh, but I mean, honestly, okay, but, but, I just sit there and go, dude, take your fucking time. What do you got to lose? But but listen to how you said that. Likely to be back soon. <laughs> like, how many qualifiers need to be put on that by the Sharks? You oh, know? dude. But it's like, just let Corona get, you know, keep getting some work. What do you have to lose? That's what I'm saying. Like When you have nothing, <laughs> there's nothing to lose. <laughs> All right. Uh, TSN did a mock draft, and uh, Sharks uh, worked out pretty well for them. Now, um, I don't know why they have Pittsburgh going in that 11th spot, because that would be San Jose's. Well, they just, <laughs> they just 
did it based on who the pick originally belonged to. Yeah, no, I get because that because that Tampa Bay pick belongs to Chicago. Yeah, but you you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but either way, you uh, God can like, can we get a little bit of luck finally for the Sharks? Just just to scotch. Be nice. <sighs> yeah, and so last time I looked, tell me if I'm wrong, but um, Pittsburgh is still at the uh, spot. By points percentage, 12th? 6, 7, 8. So by points percentage, they're ninth. Oh, fuck. What? what? So they lost more games then since... The, oh, shit. Yeah, they got pumped by Edmonton today. <sighs> God damn it. I told you, dude, they're brutal, dude. The Sharks are going to beat them, probably. Oh, fuck. Yeah, at Pittsburgh. Dude, the Sharks got to lose that game. God yeah, they're it. they're they're ninth by points percentage and eighth by points. Oh yeah, yeah. But you know what? But, but it even doesn't then, matter. But, but it doesn't on, matter, right? Because it's because it's unprotected next season if it goes there. Right. So, guess what? Like, if if Pittsburgh is tenth this year, let's just say, don't think for one second they're making the playoffs next year. <laughs> yeah. No <laughs> when shit. they're when they're arguably worse, right? Oh, dude. I'm like, saying it. Not not only not only did they trade away Jake Gensel, who is their best goal scorer, Crosby, Malkin, Rust, Raquel, Smith, all the year Latang, Carlson, all a year older, Tristan Jerry a year older. Granted, he's still only twenty eight, but like and, and and I've been very I've been very bullish of the Penguins lately. I do think they're rostered I think they have a quality roster. Like individually, it's just maybe not a quality mixture. Like I do think it is possible that they can get back to the playoffs next year, but with the way things are going in terms of their loyalty to players, it doesn't seem that way. Mm. I know. Uh, see, now Ian's calling out the the mock draft and button sucks. Dude, uh, just let me have a small win. <laughs> let me just do uh, one. I don't, under- I don't understand why people are saying Craig Button sucks. I think he's been pretty bad. I mean, maybe lately he sucks, but overall I think he's been very you know, net positive with his analysis. Uh, let me uh, hit a couple in the chat. Uh, Berg saying, with the Sharks' home attendance issues, they are last in the league. Uh, how much is it going to affect their ability to sign free agents? I mean, they're not signing. I'm not trying to be a dick when I say this, but they're not signing by how much, how many people in their stands. They're signing by how many zeros are on the check. And Hasso will make sure all those numbers are on there. So right. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. Um, the and Ryan pointing it out. The lack of success on the ice is the bigger deterrent for free agents. They don't want to go to a team that sucks. I guarantee you, if Arizona was knocking on the door, th- th- uh, you know, like seriously knocking on the door to like if they were like a sexy cup favorite, if they were like the Vancouver of this season, has n- they'd be getting people wanting to play for them despite playing on a college campus. Guys want to win. Mm-hmm. Um. But uh, in, I mentioned it earlier, did L.A. knocking Vegas into the into the wild card with games in hand? Hey, now we love that. But the Sharks have 19 games left. I would set the OU at, for wins at four and a half, and I'd hammer the under. And then I thought about it. I'm like, no, I'd probably hammer the under at three and a half. Now they do play Chicago twice, and like you mentioned, that fucking Pittsburgh game, <laughs> <laughs> and Arizona and Calgary, but. Man, just you know, this Minnesota, team, St. Gonna, Louis, Philly. yeah, but dude, yeah, but we saw what Minnesota's willing to do to win today. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying, like the Sharks, the Sharks have like their remaining 19 games. A lot of these games are against shitty teams. Now, that but said, San Jose is the shittiest team aside that, from that Chicago. Is, that is 100 percent correct. But what I think that means is that the likelihood of them stealing two points is more likely. Gotcha. All right, well, I mean, almost 90 minutes into it, we're finally getting to hero and zero. Why don't we just skip to the end? <laughs> I will not shortchange our audience, people. Yeah, well. All right, hero, uh, I mean, dude, how can it not be Bortolo? Four, like I said, I mean, four goals in the last two games, responsible for three of them, and he got a game winner. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about you? I do have some honorable mentions, but how, 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 where's your hero? I I don't think there is one this week. I mean, maybe... Fair point. I mean, 
Dude, give it to I'm Duclair, gonna, I mean, dude. He had five points in three games and, and got the hell out of here. Yeah, that's a good shout, but I kind of <laughs> think I want to – I think I want to. I'm gonna. It's gonna be a courtesy hero to Alexander Barabanov for being told he was gonna be traded and then not getting traded. Dude, I I do. I can't wait to hear his fucking postseason exit Cause interview. Because I'll, I'll tell you what, like I'm dying for this season to be over. I can only imagine how he feels. <laughs> you right. Uh, and then uh, honorable mention. I'll say Krona because uh, he got his first NHL win in with what can charitably be called an NHL team in front of him. It was in the NHL. So they say. Uh, on the zero side, uh, you just mentioned it, but dude, Barabanov, man, you posted no numbers and you got no trade. Yeah. Who's your zero? Mm, my zero is... <laughs> Again, like I, I don't know that I can pick a zero because everybody was just terrible, right? But Except, except Bordelow. That's fair. Um, I would say just on the whole, I think the Sharks are zeros specifically for what happened against Dallas on Tuesday. <laughs> like having a, to your point, having a three goal lead and then completely squandering it. Like I understand With the, seven minutes left. Right. And I understand the Sharks are terrible. Don't get me wrong. But even the worst teams have basic fundamentals. Yeah, you, you, and this is something we've been talking about, and and this is why I understand why Quinn looks so dejected sometimes, is the fact that, like we said, we're sixty games into this, and this team still can't play with a fucking lead. It's just, oi. Um, but honorable mention on the zero side, Ferraro, dude, five games in March so far. You're a dash six, no points despite leading the team in time on ice. Good God, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, just some quick ones around the NHL. Dude, how did Florida get one over so hard with the Tarasenko deal to uh, Ottawa? Because Tarasenko had a no-move clause, and he was only willing to go to Florida, so Ottawa needed to get something. See how easy that was, kids? Like, and, like and, all and the, I all the like, bitching and complying, c crying and complaining about, I don't understand it. And like jerk just explained it in one sentence. Yeah. I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, Ottawa was painted into a corner because Tarasenko only wanted to go to Florida. Um, evidently he has a house in Florida. I did not know that. And um, so Ottawa had to take what they could get. But the thing is like, keep in mind as well, like the, it only cost Ottawa to uh, money cap space to get Tarasenko. So the fact that they got anything for him is a net positive, right? Yeah, dude. And Florida looks like a genius because in his first game with the Panthers, he had two goals. <laughs> did, did you have scratch on that? You know, <laughs> I would like, I I'm like, I've mentioned all season. I'm very much a law of averages better. And also in addition to that, a like, Okay, who's close to a milestone? Who's close to a notable moment? Sure. Better. So, and I know it's easy to say now, but like the thought did cross my mind of like, oh, because you know how it is. Like you never know if a player is going to play right away, right? And so the thought crossed my mind like, man, whenever Tarasenko's first game with the Panthers are, like I got to be looking at him. And then I look at the score page and I'm like, oh, I guess his first game was today. So. <laughs> Uh, any other big trades stand up for you? Obviously not involving the Sharks. Um, Is there anybody you were just like, did not have that on the bingo card? Or, you know, didn't hear a lot of people t chatting that one up? I don't know. I kind of felt like, I kind of felt like everything that we, actually, I will take that back. The uh, Bowen Byram for Casey Middlestat trade was kind of out of the blue just because, there was not really any indication that either player was available. But now, I mean, really smart for Colorado because, you know, they traded for Sean Walker, who's a really good defenseman. So Bowen Byram became expendable, and Colorado addressed their hole at the second-line center position with a guy who's 25. So they get him for the cup run, but he's going to be around for a while. On the flip side of it, is there a move that wasn't made? Is there a team that you're like, oh, fuck, I would have thought they would have done something to try to shore up the run or try to get something to sell off 
like, I don't know, like St. Louis or something? You know, I expected the, the Maple Leafs to do more. Now, I think the Maple Leafs forward depth is the best it's been pre-trade deadline, um, maybe ever in this eight-year window that they've been contending <laughs> for the playoffs. But, you know, the Tampa given, keeps fucking up. Well, given how their season is going, like, I'm kind of surprised that they didn't do something. And they don't need to bring in a superstar or anything, but kind of shore things up. I mean, at the end of the day, their defense is still atrocious. And yes, they bring in Joel Edmondson, who I like, don't get me wrong, but bringing in a good defenseman doesn't automatically make their defenseman they already have play better. Yeah. Uh, let me give something to Chris here in the chat real quick. It says, please give me something to cling to that might help get me through next season. Uh, how funny, how great will it be, like, say, five years from now, and you've got McAlini, Eklund, Bordalo, Musty, uh, Will Smith, guys just gelling, coming together, and uh, Muka Madulin, and and it's all working, and we look back on this while the Sharks have, like, are kicking ass again, and we can go, hey, man, remember that one week when we all, like, lost our shit over Hurdle getting traded? Like, so there you go. Write that down on your calendar. <laughs> How does Kessel stay unsigned, dude? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought he was going to sign with Vancouver just because that's kind of the perfect situation for him where they're so loaded that you can kind of um, – you can kind of hide his deficiencies, right? Well, and I was like, I'm surprised Vegas didn't bring him back. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But I don't know. I kind of think the fact that he didn't get a contract with um, with Vancouver, it does make me think that his career might be over. And that's Obvi not say, oh, like excuse me, uh, Macklin Celebrini. Obviously, I conflated the the name. Calm down. Go ahead. Um, like obviously, like Phil Kessel, like all of the IQ is still there. Like the hands are still there, the shooting, the passing, the brain, the vision, it's all still there. But I don't think the skating can keep up with his brain. And so even though he has, he's still a highly skilled player, I don't think he's fast and fluid enough skating to, um, to stick around. So he's probably, he's probably done unless, you know, maybe next season somebody gives him a tryout during training camp and he can get a contract that way, right? I mean, I we all thought, I, I mean, can't believe it. I mean, we all thought Eric Stahl's career was over and then he came back last year, right? So I don't think he's for sure, for sure gone, but I think it'll take a special circumstance for Kessel to get another contract. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about Torts getting suspended for two games and fined 50K for unprofessional conduct? Directed at the officials because he wouldn't leave the bench. <laughs> I and if you get the uh, if you get the opportunity on Twitter or whatever, go look at the replay of the video because Torts like Torts is just like fuck you. I'm not leaving. <laughs> I I I love it because my so my great. my my opinion on or my stance on how the referees are treated has is long documented. I I think they have way too much leash. I think they're babied and handheld far too much. And so I love seeing somebody challenge the referees and saying, "Hey, you know, you're an equal partner as is the league, as is the players and management and everything. Yet you guys get let off the hook and you guys have your hand held through everything. Screw that. I'm going to yell and scream at you so you get it." And so I loved it and I love the uh the owner of the Flyers basically saying like Tort stood up for our brand. We love that. We will pay whatever the fine is. No problem. Yeah. No, I love that too. And I've noticed, because we get those emails from the league whenever, you know, a fine or a suspension or whatever is called out. And it seems as though over the last couple of weeks, I've been seeing an uptick in emails that say so-and-so was fined for like berating an official. Mm -hmm. And to your point where these guys are coddled, I would like to see, like, they don't have to do it after every game because not every game warrants it. But for games that they do issue a fine, at the very least, I'd like the officials to come out and say, you know, this is the, you know, this is why this happened. 
So like just be a little bit accountable for this happening. So with with, with the NHL, there's there's four there's four equal partners to the NHL. Yeah. There's and the, I know this there, will never happen. I'm just saying I'd like to see it happen. There's the league, there's the team management, there's the players, and there's the referees. The officials includes linesmen. Of those four equal partners, the officials are the only ones that don't have to answer for their actions. They are the only ones of the four that don't have to deal with any supplemental discipline. I And I've told the story on the podcast before, but I'll tell it again. There was a, a game in 2020. It was believed Minis- between Minnesota and, funnily enough, it might have been Philadelphia. But definitely our no, I'm getting that mixed up. I was in Minnesota when I was watching this game. Uh, I believe it was Philadelphia as well. And one of the players was saying to the referee, hey, you know, uh, pissed off, but not rude, saying, hey, that's I can't believe you missed that call. He blatant. It was very blatant, blah, 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 pleading their case again, obviously mad, but not rude. And the referee who was mic'd up said, go fuck yourself and ejected the player from the game for berating him. And that situation never had to be answered for. Yeah, that that's this is the type of shit that I that just makes my head explode. And it's like you have to be held at least a little accountable for some of this nonsense. And I will say, who, there was some. The, this came out. Oh, when was it? See, you have much better recall than I do, but I do remember uh, at least one or two officials getting like knocked down a peg because they had fucked up enough times over the course of like a week or so. And it was like in April or whatever it was like, uh, or maybe it was during the first round of the playoffs. They got no more playoffs for the rest of the, that whole time because they well, fucked up. Yeah. There was a referee <laughs> or was um, that the game seven officials? <laughs> yeah, that well, that was that, but there was a, um, I forget the name of the NHL ref, uh, which He's such a like a notable person, so I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. Not Wes McCauley. No, but uh, he's notable for the wrong reasons. But uh, everybody loves Wes McCauley. Oh, sure. But anyway, <laughs> so this referee, they were caught on a hot mic, basically saying, "Oh, I have to give Nashville a penalty to make up for it." Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And and he was already that was already his last season anyway, and so the NHL was like, "Why don't you just retire early?" Oh, uh, it was Tim Peel. Yeah, no, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Jeez, God, that was such a bad look. Yeah, I mean, I felt like I had thing. to even it up. Fuck you. Right. And we and we all know that that happens, but like it's kind of an open secret, you know? Yeah. Like don't be less obvious. Um all right, and finally from NHL related shit, uh I mean, dude, you were popping off about this earlier. I think this is great. And it and it introduced a new rule to my vocabulary that I wasn't aware of, but the Wild pull their goalie in three on three OT, win the game. If you get the opportunity, it's all over Twitter. So bring that up. It, it, it's a remarkable minute of of hockey there. The flower getting out and, uh, but what I did not know is that if it's in overtime, if a team pulls the goalie and they get scored on, they lose the point they already earned. Like I don't get that. Like you literally already earned the point. How do you take it away? Yeah, I, I I don't know the logic in that unless unless it's unless it has to do unless it's something to do with like I really don't understand the I I yeah. I cannot come up with something that explains the logic to that. But nonetheless, <clears throat> Minnesota pulled a very gutsy move, which we saw that uh, Siska in the KHL they did that a couple times, pulling the goalie when they were leading and pulling the goalie in overtime, doing some real goofy shit. <laughs> Well, and, wh- well, and the Wild are in desperate need of points. They are in desperate need of points, but how? I don't, I don't know that that's worth the risk to get one more point in the standings because it's the difference between being six points back and being seven points back. <sighs> now that said, if this was like the last game of the regular season and you needed to Both. win, you needed to win to make it, I would understand that. But there's, I mean. Granted, six points back, I understand that, but there's still a lot of runway left. I mean, Nashville could easily speed have a speed wobble. So could Vegas. So could L.A. You know. Mm-hmm. The, either way, that was just remarkable. And I'm like, is this going to start a new trend? 
I could. I mean, like I said, it's it. it I'm surprised it took this long because this has been a thing in Europe for at least a year or two. Well, I was so gonna I'm surprised s- it took this long. I mean, imagine like if if you have possession, and there's like 40 seconds left, you know, and you need that point. Hmm. It's gonna be gonna be fun to see if anybody else tries to pull this shit now that now that somebody's seen it work. We all know what a copycat league is. <laughs> All right, uh, finally, let's get to our tweet of the week. And uh, coming to us from the San Jose Sharks self-aware Twitter, during the Dallas game, when they were up (laughs) 6-3, they tweeted out, my lead is in danger. And lo and behold, it was. I've never seen the Sharks Twitter more self-aware than this moment. So I don't know if you happen to remember. So... Uh, when they when they came back against the Islanders earlier in the season, they tweeted out like a super saturated photo of the Sharks players celebrating a goal. And it was like, we got a situation here. And the photo said, you just lost to the San Jose Sharks. Oh, yeah. And and so when they were up, whatever it was, six to three or, or six to three against Dallas, I found that picture and I or I quoted I copied the link to that tweet. And I replied to because they made a tweet of I think it was Granlin's goal where they were like, oh, the Sharks are buzzing out there. And so I copied the link to that tweet from December and replied. And I said, got to bring this one back, guys. And then Dallas immediately scored three goals to tie. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) All right. Uh, San Jose Barracuda. Well, you've got one win in your last eight games. There you go. Just give me something to watch. You know, the San Jose Giants better be worth watching this year. I mean, Jesus. All right, prize time. Um, dude, there had to have been some over guesses. because uh, <laughs> I don't I don't know that anybody thought that the number was gonna be quite that low for the first two games. But yeah, so it was uh the the com or the the quiz was this past week, three home games, what would be the total combined attendance? Right. So whip it out. So the total combined attendance for these three games was 37,155. And we had 12 entries. Five of them went over. (laughs) Or I'm sorry. Yeah, five of them went over. Well, and was it, didn't the the winning answer you gave last week, wasn't that in fact over? Uh, Yes. (laughs) Uh, So the winner. And did you uh, get the right winner? Did you see my notes on this? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so the winner, and again, first time player, first time winner, which two weeks in a row, nice, is Max Siegel. Shout out, how are you? Um, they have already been contacted. Their address is already up on the uh, spreadsheet, so that's there for you. Hell yeah. Uh, did also want to ask, so I don't forget, uh, shipping from last week's winner, Santino. Uh, they want to know if you received it in the Venmo. Yes. That is covered. Okay, so, so I will re- I will reply. I will let them know that we got it. Yeah, we're all good. Um, all right, so we got four games this week, all on the road. It's uh, four too many, if you ask me. Oh, dude, you are not wrong, sir. So, at Philadelphia, oh no, we don't get to see Torts. Uh, at Pittsburgh, at Columbus, and then at Chicago, first time. Yes, yeah, the first. No, wait. Is this the first time we're seeing Bedard? Because wasn't Bedard out the last time the Sharks played Chicago? Sounds right. So I think this is the first time. Um, what? It, uh, oh, and it's a takeover next week. Yay, which means uh, earlier than it's, normal start. I was going to say, it's the good takeover. Hell yeah. Uh, I think that's the rest of them. The, like if there's any more. Are there any more? Uh, yeah, April 7th. And yeah, that's another early one. Hell yeah. Uh, what do you, What do you want to do? For uh for the four games this week, how do you want to play this? I'm gonna say, and okay, here's one. This one's a little <laughs> spicy. All right, good and good because I'm on. Quite honestly, I'm tired of trying to come up with shit. <laughs> so, and this is kind of a spicy meatball. Recency, recent, a bit of a recency bias thing here. All right, but because he's buzzing. In these four games, what are your thoughts on Thomas Bordalo shots on goal? Hmm. Lends itself to a lot of ties. 
Yes, but there's also four games, and what are the chan- What's more likely, him continuing to play well or him regressing? Mm. Maybe there's a tiebreaker. Maybe it's. I don't know. Okay. I think I'd, I'd prefer. How, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'd prefer how board many, a low time on ice, but okay. Well, we always do that. Here's this: How mm, many shots? Because it on, works. How many shots on goal, and tiebreaker? What game will he have the most? I'll give you that. Okay, so explain it to the people. So the contest for this week, the question is, in these four games coming up, which is at Philadelphia, at Pittsburgh, at Columbus, at Chicago, how many total shots on goal will Thomas Bordalo have in those four games? Your tiebreaker is which of those four games will he have the most shots on goal? So, for example... And I'm going to uh, give you my answer, and I'm going to give you the answer. <laughs> Thomas Bordalo is going to have you know nine mo- molasses gonna have, is, is going to copy you. <laughs> mortal Thomas Bordalo is going to have nine shots on goal, and the game with the most will be against Columbus. That's the answer. So okay. <laughs> uh, send them off to hockeyjerk10 at gmail.com. Uh, remember, uh, the uh, answers must be submitted before puck drop of the first game, which is uh, Tuesday at Philadelphia. So I believe that's a 4, 4 p.m. Pacific. Yeah. So get them in by then. Again, hockeyjerk10 at gmail.com. It's all one word with the two numbers there at the end. And uh, outside the US 48, if you win, you cover the freight. As normal. Um, yeah, I'm still pissed off about the uh, the tickets, the ticket, uh, the reporting used, whatever. But I have hope. I th- I'm I'm thinking maybe that Calgary game on the ninth. I get back. We'll see. Maybe the St. Louis game, but that is a Saturday. Oh, and they gave away a shit ton of tickets. Never mind. I was gonna say, you know, I almost feel like that's how uh, there there was somebody who who posted. Uh, something about hey, there was like seventeen thousand people at the uh, at the Ottawa game yesterday, and I'm like, that's awesome, that's great. I put it in context. Everybody in the section I was sitting in all had free tickets. <laughs> you know, like I'm not trying hey, to be a were, dick. They, it's they just, were still there. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say at least they used them. It's like I'm not trying to be a dick, but you know, like it is. It it it's true. I'm not lying. Um. But yeah, this this ticket tickets distributed nonsense is fuck you. <laughs> God damn it. All right. So um like we said, four games this week. It's the start of a five game roadie. We will take after or take over after dark next Sunday following the game at Chicago. You can uh, find him on Twitter at hockey underscore jerk. You can find me at AJ underscore strong. Remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Leave you take in the comment section of the video if you were not able to join us live. Remember, you can keep us commercial free by using that super chat option during our live shows. Better yet, we appreciate it if you use Venmo and you can file a, find us at Teal Town USA. Shout out again to Falcon Strike 21 and Mitya for using the super chat option for tonight's show. And if you need that 24-7 fix of Sharks Talk, you can hit up the jerk man on the Twitter at hockey underscore jerk to get your own VIP invite to the Discord server and uh, find links in, well, you know, all the social media nonsense, if you must. You can find it all on tealtownusa.com. Remember to check out After Dark following every single game this week. But if you uh, want to uh, catch up on everything that happened for the trade deadline, again, we had a couple shows that happened on Friday. It was uh, Mark, Ian, and Lacey getting down, along with Puck Guy and Jewels. So make sure you go uh, check that out, because um, there's something fun about hearing Jewels discipline people who were losing their mind in the chat. Just like, okay, everybody, just chill the fuck out. <laughs> not, <laughs> not to mention, and and I will say this was pretty funny. Um, watching watching their show is when the when the details of the hurdle thing was starting to drop, and it was like, okay, hurdle and a pick, and then 
wait a minute, no, it's going to be Hurdle and two picks, and then they're going to get this prospect. And Jules just keeps saying, okay, Puck Guy, this can't be it. There must be more. <laughs> like, like for 15 minutes, this can't be all of it. We can't, you know, like stop losing our minds here. The, the, and then lo and behold, yeah, that was it. <laughs> and you just go, fuck. So now that it's all said and done and everybody, yeah, I mean, I don't expect Barabanov to pout, but um, what do you look for over these last 19 games? Aside from what we mentioned earlier about, you know, like Zadina, can you show a want to? a desire to, to keep her going. Um, you know, are there any players that you're going to kind of key in on whether they're FAs or whatever it is that you just like, you know, show me something like, do you expect to see a little bit more better decision-making from Thrun or like, will Ferraro stop trying to block shots? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple, so there's a handful of players I'm looking at for different reasons. So, uh, Zetterland, Zetterland, Eklund, and Bordalo make as big of an impact as you can. <laughs> like it or not, these guys are probably the future, uh, or at the very least, they are the right now. So make the most of what you can do. Uh, for different reasons, I'm looking at Philip Zadina. I like Zadina. I think he should be re-signed by the Sharks. But in case that's in doubt by anybody in management, give them reasons to eliminate that doubt. I think if he get there's 19 games left and he's at 10 goals right now. I think if he can end the season between 12 and 15 goals, I think it'll bode very well for him. I got, I got a spicy meatball for you. Sure. I'm going to say over the last 19 games, I'm going to say Vlasic scores one more goal. I could see it. And then lastly, I'm looking I would add Thrun to the Eklund Bordalo Zetterlin conversation, just, you know, do your best, take positive strides, improve, contribute, right? <laughs> and the last one I'm looking at, Kalen Addison, my guy. I like Kalen Addison. I thought it was a shrewd uh, move to bring him in, but I'm worried he's playing his way to not even getting a qualifying offer. Yep. So s similar to Zadina, but at a much, much, much deeper level, Give management a reason to keep you. Uh, for me, um, it's it's a it's a few of the vets. It's like can can Vlasic play with some give a fuck? Sure, which can, I think he has. Yes, uh, definitely. Since uh, I mean, he went on that stretch right where it's like five goals in like nine games or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like ever, it was after he had taken like uh, what like a week and a half of PTO or some shit. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and if you know, you know, but, um, ever since he came back, it was like, uh, seemed to, uh, shoulder, seemed to be walking a little taller The you know, not as hunched over, seemed to be moving, gliding a little better. So let's see if Vlasic can, uh, keep his give a fuck up. Same thing for Mike Hoffman. Yeah. Can he have a uh, give a fuck? The final 19 games. I mean, if you're going to set the over under for amount that LeBanc plays, Jeez. I mean, uh, well, five and a half. I mean, <laughs> I'm see, I thought him playing him playing against the Islanders with Barabanov and Duclair out. I thought that this would be the start of him getting games, right? Yeah. And then, but then you get you get rid of Hurdle and, and he still can't even crack the lineup. Yeah. You get rid of Hurdle. You get rid of Duclair and <laughs> like Thomas Bordalo, who is not who, you know, is obviously he started the year with the Sharks, but is has you know not been around a lot lately. He's getting ice time. Clem Costin, who half of Sharks fans probably hadn't even heard of 72 hours ago, is playing. So to me, I th do you remember? <laughs> do, do, do you remember uh, that would have been three seasons ago? I think when the media asked Bob Bugner about his plan for goalies going to the end of the season. And he more or less said, not Jones. Oh, yeah. I kind of feel like that's where David Quinn is with LeBanc. Like, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like LeBanc could do everything. And David Quinn would be like, well, yeah, thanks, but your shoes untied pigeon. So go away. You know what I'm saying? 
God. Like, David Quinn hates Kevin LeBanc. Like, hates him. Well, and you would think that there's a way to play yourself out of that doghouse, and for whatever reason, LeBanc just cannot find the combination. Yeah, I don't know. Which I will say is unfortunate, because I do think just in a bubble, the player skill set I do like, but it's been a struggle. Yeah, well, I mean, look, with any luck, he'll find a coach that can you know, work for him, that it, that it all works out. But it's clearly it not going to happen in San Jose. Yeah. So I guess that's, that's kind of what we're going to look for over, these, uh, over the five-game road trip, over the final 19 of the season. And look, you, what'd you say? We only have like six more of these to do. <laughs> uh, yeah. So one, two, three, four, five. We have six more podcasts after tonight. And don't think this it hasn't been a fucking chore this season, people. <laughs> <laughs> like early on, <laughs> we all knew this was coming. <sighs> so there it is. It is what it is. And uh, we'll catch you following San Jose at Philadelphia on Tuesday. And uh, Rhythm Hunter wants to know, what do I do now with my hurdle jersey? Well, Continue to wear it. Yeah, continue to wear it uh, hang, or hang it on the wall or do something and uh, enjoy the memory of how you, uh, how you ended up getting it. <laughs> there you go. Because uh, I was there when he got it. So... Any hoodles, uh, that'll do it, I guess. And, um, man, we'll see you next Sunday following, who is it? Chicago. Just remember, you just got to lose those two games to Chicago, and then it all it all works out. I mean, that'll kind of do it, you think, maybe? You would hope. <laughs> so here it is, your moment of zen. Good night, everybody. Fire everyone. <laughs>